Well, it's sure good to be with all of you and have an opportunity to study here in the book of Acts. Last time we uh, just barely got started with chapter 13, so uh, we're beginning Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, the spread of the gospel to the west, and uh, we're all very thankful for it because of the truth of the gospel that spread to um, all of Europe because of Paul's work and what a difference it's made in the history of the world. So we have Barnabas and Saul set apart for their work, their labor in Cyprus, the journey to Paphos and Antioch, Paul's first sermon that's recorded for us in Antioch of Pisidia, the results of what happened there on the next Sabbath after that sermon, and then the results in Antioch of Pisidia. Last time... um, we got a little ways through this verse. It says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, uh, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, who uh, had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So we're told about, uh, again, this congregation that's there in Antioch is going to be the hub of the second half of the book of Acts where all of the missionary journeys start is out of the city uh, or the church at Antioch there and they're going to spread the gospel to the Gentile world. The people were first called Christians there in Antioch and uh, it is a very strategic location. They have both prophets and teachers there. Um, People that are inspired by the Holy Spirit are prophets that teach. And then teachers, you know, as we said at the very last thing I think I said last week was all prophets are teachers, but all all teachers are prophets. (laughs) Prophets get their message directly from the Holy Spirit. And they had had those men there also teaching by inspiration. There's a number of people that are mentioned there. Barnabas and Saul are in that congregation. And notice that Barnabas' name still comes first every time it's mentioned. It's going to stay that way until they get to Cyprus and Paul uh, rebukes Elymas or Bar-Jesus. And then every time after that, it's Paul and Barnabas. (laughs) So they flip roles about who's the most prominent and uh, who's the leading character. All of a sudden it becomes Paul from then on. So that's interesting, isn't it, that they would mention them in one order up until that moment. And then afterward, Luke records it the other way around. And, uh, of course, those two are both inspired by the Holy Spirit and are teachers, Paul an apostle. Barnabas is called an apostle in the sense that he's sent out also by the, by the church to preach, where Paul is sent directly by the Lord to be the apostle of the Gentiles. Simeon, who's called Niger, Niger means black, and uh, some people think he might have been uh, uh, a Negro, but it could be that he's a dark-complected Jew that it's talking about. So uh, either way, there's Simon that was there. It is a Jewish name. Uh, Lucius uh, was from Cyrene, a city in North Africa that you read a lot about in the New Testament. And uh, in Romans 16 and verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater and my kinsmen, or who are my kinsmen. So these Lucius was also Jewish and somebody that was related. Uh, Paul says there, <laughs> one of my kinsmen. So that's kind of interesting in it. He seems to be mentioned again, except he's in Rome this time. So he's traveled across from Antioch to there. Uh, but Jew among the original evangelists maybe that came there to the city of Antioch and preached. Maybe that's how he's related to Paul in the gospel maybe instead of in the flesh. But... Uh, remember men came across from Cyprus and other places after they heard about Cornelius and Gentiles can be preached to and they came to Antioch and started preaching the gospel to both Jews and and Greeks and Manian uh, it's the Greek spelling of Manahem or Manahem the king that you read about in the Old Testament of Israel Uh, it was a Jewish boy raised it says brought up with Herod Antipas. So isn't that an interesting thing? As a young boy, he was uh, uh, nourished up, brought up as a companion from childhood with Herod Antipas. And certainly 
uh, would have been somebody that could have told about a lot of the private things that went on with Herod Antipas. How is it that we know he uh, liked listening to John the Baptist and he uh, <laughs> thought that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead and you have all of this inside information about Herod Antipas and what he was thinking about things. Manian, who's now a Christian and somebody that knows Luke that wrote the book of Luke and Acts, he was brought up, he was uh, American Standard Version translated foster brother with Herod Antipas. So don't you think he could give Luke a lot of the inside things about what was going on with Herod Antipas and what he was thinking and so on? He was one of his closest companions. And isn't it interesting to think about those two boys were both raised in Rome. And then they end up, uh, Herod ruling over Galilee and, per, uh, and uh, Perea. And one of them beheads John the Baptist, mocks Jesus at his trial. And the other one becomes a Christian. <laughs> so these two guys grow up together. You see how you got a choice which way you're going to go in life? It's up to you whether you're going to remain in a sinful way of life or you're going to turn to the Lord. And Manny in turn to the Lord. And of course, if he could do it, other people could do it too, right? <laughs> it's a matter of free will. And uh, again, a uh, lot, lot to think about. I'd like to, like to know a little bit more about Manny and if I had opportunity to talk to him and what stories he might be able to tell you about the times of Christ. And um, let's see. Verse 2, And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So while these prophets and teachers are in the process of carrying out their regular religious practices of serving the Lord, and we know what the work of the church is, right? It's evangelism, it's edification, it's benevolent work for needy saints. So they were carrying out their religious duties. So... These men were influential, obviously, in that congregation. And in the midst of that, the Lord told them that they needed, by the Holy Spirit, to set apart for a special work from the church there at Antioch to go on this missionary journey. He needs Barnabas and Saul to go on that uh, mission. And they were fasting. They were missing regular meals from time to time. Fasting was only done when it was appropriate according to what Jesus teaches us about fasting. It wasn't something to just be done just by some regular religious order without having some good reason behind it. And uh, fasting is something certainly that's fitting when you have some important decision to make, some important issue that you're praying about and so on. In times of persecution, um, we have people fasting. And so it's certainly a a proper practice when done with the proper spirit behind it. It could simply mean just missing meals. They were so busy teaching the lost and trying to teach those that had been converted and then uh, doing this uh, different works of benevolence that they skipped a lot of meals as they served the Lord. And certainly that happens when you're busy, you got a lot of Bible classes going, but you don't have time to, to stop and eat a meal sometimes. You just go on to the next class, right? And uh, so that's part of it as well. So a lot of things might be behind that fasting. And uh, again, missing meals in some religious sense where it's just uh, outward show of your righteousness, Jesus condemns. <laughs> no, it's got to be done for the right reasons, right motives are behind it, not just as a show. Um, it's not something you go around and tell everybody about to show how righteous you are. Um, the Holy Spirit's word was communicated to them. Most likely, one, there, are, there are several prophets there. One of them got the message in the Holy Spirit through that prophet told all the rest of them. The Holy Spirit says we need to set apart Barnabas and Saul to go on a missionary journey and go out there and share the gospel in new areas. And that was communicated and they got that revelation and now they're called to that work. So how important is the work of evangelism? <laughs> Pretty important. The Holy Spirit sent a special mes message down saying, you need to not just work here in Antioch, you need to send the gospel out to other places. And the same thing is true in today, isn't it? We're not getting a 
we have these examples of what God's will is that are given to us. We're not getting direct revelation about what to do, but we see the Spirit is interested in the gospel going other places other than where it's already been planted. And uh, we should be interested in that as well. If we're guided by the Holy Spirit, live by the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, attitude and so on, that we would feel that way about the gospel also. So they received this instruction, go go preach. And, you know, one writer made the mention, says, where would we all be? Most of us have European backgrounds of some kind. If the gospel never went anywhere but Antioch, it stopped there. Would we still be bowing down to some rock or stick somewhere instead of knowing the gospel that's come down to us? How important is it to all of us <laughs> that the Holy Spirit said, go preach. Go preach in a new area and let those people hear the gospel too. And churches be planted there. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So Luke reveals how these prophets and teachers set the apostles apart for their work. Uh, they prayed for them. Uh, they you know, wished them God's speed, I'm sure, in the things that they were praying and God's blessings and protection and that they might have success. And they laid their hands on them. They had some outward show of approval and dedicating them to go do this work. We're behind you 100%, right? <laughs> Set them apart. Same thing we would do when we're appointing elders or deacons or sending someone to some new area to preach. Same kind of a practice uh, to let them know that uh, we wish them uh, God's grace and that we are fully support them and are behind them. It says they sent them away. The word sent there includes not just see ya. <laughs> it's the idea you send somebody with help. You send them with the supplies they need to get started. You know, they, they sent them off uh, to go do this work. So it would include support for their journey and not just, uh, well, have fun over there. <laughs> you know, the, con the congregation was helping to the extent they could, Barnabas and Paul, to get going on this mission and to be able to carry it out. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on those first three verses? It's sort of the first paragraph there. Anybody want to add anything? Yes. Well, I just say that it's something that should come natural when it's something important to you that you would put aside meals as part of just concentrating on spiritual things when something really important is going on. Um, but it's not, it's not commanded as a regular religious practice anywhere. Um, but it's something, you know, when it's appropriate, it's, it's a good thing to do. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's all kinds of studies coming out nowadays that it's got, you know, medical benefits to skipping meals and going without eating sometimes. It's good for your, the way your body rebuilds itself. So it's, it's not anything that is emphasized, certainly. At, we read about it here in the book of Acts. We have some examples um, and then after that, you really don't read about it anymore. So it's not like a big emphasis, evidently, that we're commanded to do this, you know, regularly. It's something you have to choose on your own to do. It's an individual. Well, they had added the Pharisees a bunch of regular fasts. Like everybody was supposed to fast this day and that day. And when, when Jerusalem fell, I mean, they had a, all kinds of different days that they had. The only f fast that was ever commanded in the Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement. They didn't eat. They afflicted their souls while they're offering sacrifice for all their sins of the previous year. But all the other fasts were aided, you know, added by men later. So if you're going to do it, don't, don't do it to show off, <laughs> right? That's, all uh, right, um, where was I? <laughs> all right, we're getting ready to hear. We just started a new paragraph here, verse 4 and 5. So they're leaving Antioch, and it tells us the, he gives us, a, uh, I guess, the uh, ports of call here. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So we can see on the map there the Antioch is a little ways inland on the river. You'd come up the river from Cilicia is where the main harbor, there's a big naval base there and so on. And you come up the river to, so they're going the other way now. They're going down and sail across to the Isle of Cyprus just off the coast. 
there from uh, Syria. And uh, on that island, um, that river is the Orontes River, 16 miles from Antioch to that naval base. And then they sailed to the island of Cyprus. Many Jews lived on that island. It was under the control of Herod the Great. There were a lot of mines and things that were there that the Jews worked. And there were, you know, many, uh, many Jewish people lived there, a lot of synagogues. So they go to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. It was Paul's uh, marching orders. So he had a base of operation, you know, a way to go to the Jews first that knew the Old Testament and show them that Jesus is the Christ, and then from there take it to the Gentiles. So there's a natu- it was a, definitely a good next stepping stone. And there's already some churches there because we read earlier about some from Cyprus bringing the gospel to Antioch. But it, evidently there weren't many churches there. And that's the first work they go, first place they go, to try to uh, spread the gospel further in the in the island of Cyprus. And uh, verse five. And when they reached uh, Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. So they make it to Cyprus. The largest city on Cyprus is the first one they come to. It's closest to the coast of Syria. And it's the biggest harbor. It's a very well-protected harbor of Salamis. And uh, it was the old Greek capital of the island. Since the Romans took over, they made Paphos uh, the capital. So they, um, it's on the other end of the island where Paul's going to end up. But the old capital is Salamis. And again, large Jewish population. It says synagogues, not just one synagogue. So there were many synagogues in that city that Paul could go around. We know his practice from what we read later in Acts. He would get up in, and read and show them in the Old Testament that the Christ had to suffer and die and rise again from the dead and show them all those prophecies. And then after they were thoroughly instructed about what was to come, he'd say, Jesus is that person that was being talked about. And uh, it doesn't mention how much success they had uh, Brother McGarvey says since it doesn't mention great numbers turning to the Lord, maybe it wasn't all that successful here in the first <laughs> town or two that they went to. But the, Paul always usually had some success in the teaching. You know, It just wasn't overwhelming maybe like in some other places. Um, but uh, they have John Mark there working with them as their helper. And we've mentioned him before as the one that was uh, the writer of the book of, book of Mark. He was... Paul's helper here and Barnabas and later he uh, assists Peter in his preaching and work and writes down Peter's gospel that he preached. He was an eyewitness of the life of Christ. Wouldn't he be a handy person to have? That uh, it's in his mother's house was probably the upper room where Jesus had the last supper. Uh, after you converted somebody, you could turn them over to Mark and say, Mark, tell them about, <laughs> tell them about Christ and the life of Christ and he could tell them all of those things that he, he was an eyewitness uh, person to. So he would assist the apostles in a lot of the manual labor as a young man, being able to carry baggage and do the actual immersion of people when you had a big group needed to be baptized. It wasn't just the Barnabas and Saul doing that, but Mark would help with that. So all kinds of different things of that nature probably. All right. We're just about to get to that. <laughs> Yeah, Mark starts off good, but he gets scared and goes home. So Paul's like, ah, the next journey, he doesn't want Mark with him. Says he didn't go to the work with us when we needed to go. So, uh, pardon? Yeah, he starts off good. (laughs) But the good news is by the time he got to be an older man, Paul had great confidence in him. So he didn't let it destroy his whole future that he messed up. So. That gives all of us hope because we mess up from time to time and don't do what we should, but we can get up and be forgiven and and go on and grow in our character and be more helpful. So he kind of flops as a helper on this first trip when it it gets dangerous. It says, And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. So this is... uh, fits right in with the sermon, the first sermon, doesn't it? They run into a magician that is there. They had a great influence in the court of the proconsul named Bar-Jesus. 
So it's 150 miles across the Isle of Cyprus. And uh, Luke and the Holy Spirit pass over whatever other works were done there in the island. They just get to this big event that we need to know about or the Spirit reveals to us that happens in Paphos. Uh, you're at the Roman capital of the island and there's a false prophet that's a magician and a soothsayer. Again, a wizard, a spiritualist, a medium, a fortune teller. A Probably a little bit of all of this uh, was involved in what he was doing. He pretended to be inspired by God and he's taken the name Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. But you know the name Jesus is Joshua, right? I mean, it's the same name. It's the Jewish spelling. It's the Jewish uh, or the Greek way. I'm saying it backwards. It's the Greek name for Joshua is Jesus. So he could be talking about Joshua in the Old Testament or he's heard about Jesus that did all those miracles and he's, he's the son of Jesus and claiming to have inspiration and tell you about the future and it's all, he's a big phony. So he's had a lot of influence there till the apostles show up and they hear the truth. Who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So here are these preachers that I guess are, there's quite a stir across the island and in the city of Paphos. And word comes to the proconsul about these men that have a message from God. And he's an intelligent man that's open to new ideas and, and uh, hearing truth. And so he calls to hear the word of God and hear it straight from the source, Barnabas and Saul, to come in and speak to him. Again, Barnabas is still mentioned first here. And uh, now you're going to have a, a true contrast. There have been many times that the book of Acts and Luke have been attacked where they say that he got it wrong and it's uh, not reliable history. But Luke always in the end is proven right. <laughs> and you know how these unbelievers, uh, they want to tear the Bible down. Anything they can attack, they'll attack, right? And they said, pro-councils were appointed by the Senate Okay, and the emperor, he, he put in the procurators like Pilate. So some of them answered to the Senate, some of them answered. This, Luke says, he was a proconsul. And there on the Isle of Patmos, it went back and forth, or, or Isle of Cyprus. Sometimes they were procurators and sometimes they were proconsuls. And they thought, well, Luke got it wrong. And if he got it wrong, then he's not inspired. But they found coins now. <laughs> And they found these monuments, one in Antioch of Pisidia, where Paul's going to go and preach. Sergius Paulus, pro council. It says it right there on the thing. So who was right when they dig up the monuments and they find the coins? Luke was right. And these guys were only in office sometimes a couple of years. You'd had to be somebody living at that time telling what was going on to know that. You wouldn't have been able to write that to a century later and get it right. You'd be wrong as much as you were right. But if you lived at that time and you're an eyewitness like Luke, you know what kind of office he held. And so you can trust the book of Acts and its history. It is accurate. Paulus the proconsul is the one that was there on Cyprus. And uh, Elymas, but Elymas the magician, for thus his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So instead of Bar-Jesus, his Aramaic translation is magician or great man, wise man is uh, what he was or claimed to be. And he was claiming to be all so wise in these spiritual matters of the occult and so on. And the, he says, uh, you, you can't listen to the gospel. These men are false or so forth and so on. And he tried to oppose the preaching of Barnabas and Saul. And withstand the gospel. He certainly wouldn't have been in his interest if he's getting money from the proconsul for all of his spiritual advice that he's giving. He doesn't want these Christians coming in here and having influence with the proconsul. So he opposes them, resists the message that comes from God. And here Paul takes the front. From here on, it's about Paul. Uh, he is the leader. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him. 
So the Holy Spirit comes on Paul or his influence takes charge of him. He stares at this Elemas with, uh, must have been some stare. He's looking right through him uh, as the Holy Spirit is going to speak a, a, a curse through him that causes him to be blind. It's one of those few times that you have these uh, miracles that take place that instead of healing somebody, they cause harm. And this man opposed to the truth and working for the devil is made an example in this case. And so Paul has another, or Saul has another name. He has the name Paul. And of course, there are all kinds of speculation as to why the name. Right here from now on, it never says Saul again. It's Paul. <laughs> so he, uh, he's getting ready to go on into Europe and he's talking to the pro-council, a Roman, and he's got the, the Roman name Paul. And from now on, he's called Paul. And it's interesting that the man he's preaching to is also named Paul. Sergius Paulus is the man he's preaching to. So that, I don't know if there's some connection with that, but probably he had two names like so many people in the Bible. They had their Jewish name and they had their Roman or Greek name. And Paul was a Roman citizen. And his parents probably gave him both. And he was known by both. But from now on, it's going to be the Gentile or the... The, the Latin name he's going to be known by instead of the Jewish name. And that's kind of <laughs> from there on. All of his letters, it's Paul that's writing to those churches, right? So he, he begins to go by that name, I guess, mo exclusively from here on um, and wear it. So Paul's filled with the Holy Spirit and gazes upon him in uh, great intensity. He says, and he said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? <laughs> so you talk about a reproof. I mean, that's about as powerful as it can get. Uh, he's being guided directly by the Holy Spirit. There's no question about what he's saying is true about this person. That he knows that he is a man that is full of deceit. He uses... Uh, all kinds of ways to trick people and debate them with uh, deceptive practices to listen to him and follow what he says. He uses fraud and deception, uh, different kinds of unfair, unlawful ways to get his influence. And we can see from the Old Testament, certainly all of this is a fraud and deceit. And the devil is a slanderer of God, and he is a counterfeit uh, uh, prophets, you know, are working for the devil. Anybody that teaches something contrary to the truth. So calling him a son of the devil is certainly true. He's a deceiver and a slanderer and an enemy of God, just like his spiritual father, the devil, right? He has the same kind of practices and character in trying to turn people away from the gospel. What would you, <laughs> certainly that's being a son of the devil. If you're resisting the truth that would save people's souls, so he is an enemy. He has malice and hostility uh, towards God and the souls of men by turning them away from salvation. He's an enemy of all righteousness, all that is right that God has revealed, the straight way that we should walk and live. And the way that will make you right is the gospel. It, it gives you that righteousness that comes by faith. And he says, when are you going to stop making crooked the straight ways of God? <laughs> So he's twisting the word. He's twisting the ways that are right uh, for his own purposes. And it should be that, you know, we recognize the word of God is the straight and right way um, of true religion. That's, that's the way that saves people. That makes you a friend of God, not an enemy, if you stick with what the word of God has to teach. So don't let any, anybody twist the word of God and don't twist it yourself. We need to make sure that we're following it as it's revealed to us. Don't add to it or take away from it. Verse 11, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will, not, you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So here is a... A miracle that takes place. He is struck with this blindness. The hand of the Lord is used to talk about God's power. His power came upon him. God is the one that caused this to happen. And as Paul said that. And this divine power caused him to go blind. He's punishing 
the wicked like he's done in the Old Testament times. He does it here. So the apostle had power to inflict punishment through God's power. We see that in the Old Testament prophets. You see it with Elijah where he called down fire or uh, Moses where the earth opened up and swallowed those people that rebelled. Uh, Elisha, the same thing. So there, there are a number of examples of this in the Old Testament and here we have one in the New Testament. Jesus had one of these kind of uh, signs that we were studying on Wednesday night we're about to get to where he curses the fig tree and it withers from its roots up. Here's one with the apostles. Yes, that's true. Yeah, the Lord did that one directly, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, so same, same thing had happened to him in his opposition to the gospel. Uh, that's good. Um, so same kind of total blindness. Remember, he was searching around for somebody to lead him too when he was struck on the road to Damascus here this man and it almost like nobody wants to get his hand you know hear about somebody taking him it's like whoa you know after this striking comes on him and it happens immediately a mist and a darkness that's a dramatic way of picturing that on the spot it happened and the good news for him I guess is it says for a time wasn't permanent blindness. Don't you wonder what happened to this guy later? <laughs> Did he learn not to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord after this? I hope so. <laughs> I would hope he would wake up. But we don't know. We, the, the story doesn't tell us any more about him. But it was only for a time he was blind. That's the first bell, I assume. Is that right? Thank you. <laughs> it says, Then the proconsul believed... When he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So this miracle, this striking of uh, Elymas here, it, it backs up and confirms the wonderful teaching of the gospel. So it, it helps confirm that these messengers really are speaking the word of God on how to be saved. And here you have a pro-council believe. Based on what we have read earlier in the book of Acts, that's a summary for he believed, he repented, he confessed, he was baptized, he became a member of the church. So this is very unusual, isn't it? It's something that you would mention if you were Luke, that the pro on this island believed. So here we have a Roman official that is believing. And we're, he won't be the last, of course, will he? The old uh, prophecy in Isaiah 53 talked about leaders are going to hear the gospel, hear the story about how the suffering servant was brought so humiliatingly low and yet was exalted to the highest place. And they're going to shut their mouths when they hear this. They're going to be amazed when they hear about God's plan of salvation and what He does through Jesus Christ. And there have been many other high people also. I mean, not near as many as there are other ordinary folks like us, but lots of, throughout history, there have been a number of high, high uh, people that have been converted, leading women and so on, <laughs> that we're going to hear about. So, not uh, the majority by any means, but the, it, it can have an influence on people in any position. So we shouldn't say, oh, they're too, uh, they're too important in the government, or they've got too much education, or whatever, I can't share the gospel with, the, with that person. No, it can work on anybody. If they've got a good, honest heart and will listen to the gospel and the evidence, it can convert them. And it did with this man. He was amazed about Jesus Christ. And uh, any other thoughts on Sergius Paulus and <laughs> the events there? Yes, John. Well, I, I, I agree with that to an extent that the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. But the, the, the Bible teaches us that, um, that we need to be wise and we need to be tactful. I mean, we have command to be. <laughs> and to, uh, Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. So when, he, when I go to a Jew, I know how to approach a Jew and what kind of arguments to use to start with them. I go to a Gentile. I, you know, I might start the, you, we see Paul start the argument from a different point of view. So you try to understand where they're coming from. That is important. So, yeah, right. It's, right. 
it's just like, it's like Paul says about Corinth. He said, I, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth, right? It was God's seed, <laughs> And God gives the spiritual life to the person. So you wouldn't give the praise to the preacher. He's a servant, you know, but he should do a faithful, he should be a good steward and he should be wise in the way that he builds, right? He should be a wise master builder as far as how he delivers the word and how he makes the arguments. So it's a, you know, it, there's, like, right, it, there's the, the powers in the, in the word to save the soul, the gospel. But we have a part to play in it. We can get in the way. <laughs> we can turn people off if we don't approach them in the right way. We can make it hard on somebody, right? So it's a mixture of the two. All right, uh, that's a good spot for us to stop. We'll move on to the next part of the journey, Lord willing, next time.